Hello, everybody, and welcome to another talk. Uh, we are Amit and Naroop, and in conjunction with the AOP, we're doing these talks every month where we speak to a, a creative of color who we think is very good at what they do, very talented. And we're discussing basically the reasons why there is such a lack of diversity in uh, the creative industries and specific the photography industry. So today we speak with Emily Bedixson. Is that correct? Have I pronounced your surname correct, Emily? That is correct, yes. Amazing. Uh, so yes, Emily, <laughs> Emily is a fantastic photographer. We actually were introduced to each other via um, this program that AOP have put together where creators of colour who are all members of the AOP have kind of been speaking with each other. And I saw Emily's work and I thought, wow, she is fantastic. We loved what she did. And we knew we had to have her um, on, this, on this discussion. So um, what I would love for you to do, Emily, why don't you just give us a little breakdown about the kind of work that you do and how you got uh, to where you are today? Gosh, okay, so the kind of work I do... Um, how would you describe um, it? Largely, uh, I would probably say it's, it's people, it's food, and I suppose lifestyle. Um, I think the main thing is more... I can sort of approach any project um, and it's down to the way I see it basically. So I have a similar approach to whatever it is I'm shooting, um, which is all about having intimacy and really getting in there and catching the sort of offbeat moments. Um, and that can sort of, that can literally apply to anything. So I've been fortunate that that approach means that A, I'm quite agile in the way I, I make work. And it also means that I've been able to go into to different industries. So whether it's, you know, food or traditional portraiture, editorial and commercial, you know, it's, it's just, it's been, it's been cool. It's taken a while to sort of, I think, formulate what it is I do because it's not as, as straightforward as, as, you know, some, as some photographers, um, but I feel sort of, I'm getting there, you know, it kind of it feels, it feels fairly clear now. Um, you know, when you're, uh, you're starting okay. out, Emily, um, did you did you look at other photographers in the market? Did you look at their ethnicity? Did, did you look at their background? Did that did that bother you, or did you just jump in anyway? Uh, it's a good question. I didn't look at their ethnicity because, to be honest, I it's only I mean in the last couple of years that I've even seen other people of color, if I'm honest, uh, in our industry. Um, I certainly noticed the gender disparity. So everyone I assisted were male. Um, everyone I admired, however, were female, uh, pretty much, I would say. So, so the, the people whose, whose work I, I sort of took inspiration from and, and you know, sort of dreamt of, dreamt of uh, working, you know, sort of having my work alongside were mostly women. Um, but in hindsight, and, and, you know, as I say, I didn't really think about it at the time, but they were all white women. Uh, they were all, I think, per se, they're all British. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, it wasn't something I was aware of when I started out. Um, Why do you think there were more male photographers that you were assisting than female photographers? It's a good question. I did approach uh, female photographers as well. I mean, I think the you know, top line, there are, you know, there are more male photographers than female photographers. Um, why, at, why, why do you think the underlying reason is? Wow. Well, it's a, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a big question. And obviously, similarly to ethnicity, I think what we can and can't do uh, right from the get-go, you know, our role models, what we see out there. And if all you see are white men with <laughs> very big lenses, um, then, you know, you might not even consider that that's a route. I mean, for me, it was, I sort of fell into photography. I, I studied journalism, writing was was sort of, I thought the route I was going to go. 100% um, pictured myself sitting, you know, in a sort of dark loft writing, you know, with, with lots of wine and, you know, just, I sort of had a picture, you know, had it mapped out and it was quite an insular, uh, introverted existence. So photos just sort of happened on the side. Um, and I think if I hadn't been fortunate to sort of meet a few people early on, I don't think I would have, you know, gone this way at all. And even, 
I mean, gosh, it's up until, I'd say about 2012 or something. I, I, that, I still didn't call myself a photographer. I, um, I did lots of other work just to make money. Um, you know, worked in offices, did all sorts. And, and so my, for me, my, my kind of, the cutoff for me was when I make all of my money from photography and nothing else, that's when I'm a photographer. And you could possibly trace that back to a gender uh, influence, at least, you know, that, that the, you know, women tend to, we tend to question ourselves more, be a bit more humble. Whereas, you know, quite possibly, I mean, you, you tell me, but, you know, it, it, you know, it might be easier for some guys to say, I'm a photographer, I've got the kit that makes me a photographer, you know. Yeah. I, I um, so I, I, I think it's really interesting, um, the, the kind of point you raised, because I think similar to us, um, until we could call ourselves pros when we were kind of earning all our money from photography, our existence as photographers was very much just about us. Okay, we want to work, we want to get this job done. And we weren't looking at the industry at large because all we were considering was survival, right? And I think it's only when we could call ourselves successful that we started to look at the industry and we decided to meet more people. We started to get recognised and we just realised that, okay, there's not many people that look like us. And I think that's what sometimes some photographers or some, you know, who are getting in, into the industry don't see what we see. Because for them, their main goal is, let me just make some money, man. I just want to do this for a living. Whereas we are, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of in there now. And we're like, okay, so this is what it looks like in here. And it's, yeah. not, it's, 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 it's not a very kind of diverse place. But, you know, when we started out, did you look at the market and were you were you worried? Did you think there's not enough people of colour? I'm not I, do I, I never I don't think that ever put me off at all. But just and I think that's that's a personal thing because I went to private school and I was used to seeing white faces all around me. So it didn't make a difference, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I'm used to that. All my teachers were white, headmaster was white, majority of my friends were white. So, you know, it made no difference to me. But I can understand if you're not from that background like I was then it could be different. But I don't think that yeah. should be a reason uh, people should not do it. But ultimately, I guess, uh, Emily, we'll talk a lot more about your, your background, how you got into the industry. What we want to try to discuss with you today is, is like all our conversations we're having, in your view, what do you think we can do um, to try to promote change? You know, and, you know, my, and I'll still kind of stay true to this, my thought is that it has to start at a very early stage where, you know, it has to start at the art colleges. It has to start at, at the at universities. It has to start, you know, in in in, in homes when people make a de decision to become a creative or photographer or filmmaker, because you have to. It's a whole process. It's, there's not going to magically be a whole bunch of uh, creatives of color who are going to join the industry. They have to start at that, take that first step. And I think yeah. it's like, how can we encourage people to take that first step? You know, and then yes, maybe five, ten years down the line we might start seeing some new faces. And fair enough, there is talent that is there ready to come into the industry, but I guess that's another conversation. How do they then get into the industry? But let's talk a little bit more about how, um, you know, how you got, I know you said you were, you, you were um, studying journal, journalism um, and you moved to Glasgow, right, I believe? And you were, you were living yeah, there. So when you first started getting into photography, did you find that, uh, your colour was hold, was holding you back? Did he face any prejudice, any racism, any discrimination, do you think? More than likely, yes. But, you know, I think in terms of intersectionality, it's quite, it's quite hard to pinpoint which part of me. So was it because I was a person of colour, because I was a woman, because I, you know, I was LGBT or whatever, you know, it could, there could be any number of reasons. It could even be the fact that you know, I'm quite a sort of soft-spoken, quiet person, which means in, in group situations, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily get heard. At, you know, so, you know, when you're sort of hanging around, you know, galleries and all that, you know, it's kind of, I just tend to hang back and not say a lot or have a, you know, conversation in the corner with one person, all that, you know, and all of those things, you know, feed into the same, same end result. So it's hard to say. I mean, like you, I grew up, really surrounded by by white people um and you know I remember my sort of my childhood friends uh stereotypically sort of right-wing 
uh, stepdad who was, you know, he was just the caricature of a mean stepdad, you know, whatever you'd imagine, he, he did it. And, uh, you know, and his sort of biggest compliment for me was, you know, oh, but you're not foreign, you're just like us, which was, you know, fully meant as a compliment. Um, so I don't know if you sort of recognize that, that feeling of, you know, oh, don't worry about, you know, don't worry about your skin color, don't worry about, you know, because we have accepted you so you're safe in, in this group. But nonetheless, you know, even that comment means that everyone sees what you look like immediately, you know. Um, but I think growing up in the sort of, in the 80s and the 90s, it was in Denmark anyway, that was that was seen as, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the attitude that some people still have where color blindness is seen as a positive, yeah. you know, that, that people are afraid to acknowledge the fact that, that you're different and that that isn't a problem, you know, they feel like the biggest compliment they can pay you is to say, you're just like us, you're just like white people. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly no one ever specifically said, oh, we don't think this job is right for you, or please could you go and photograph some Asian people? Um, on Possibly on the contrary, I only this year photographed uh, another Korean person actually just a, as a commission for the first time which is obviously reflecting the fact that there are hardly any Asian, like Southeast Asian people in the UK who are, you know, so sort of prolific in that sense. So um, there could be a number of reasons for that as well. I, that was a long-winded question, uh, sort of answer or a long-winded oh, way to say, I don't, I don't know. Um, I don't feel that I have overtly been discriminated against but I'm sure that when it comes to gut feelings when it comes to people just making a choice based on what they prefer you know the the sort of the slightly um abstract decisions I'm sure the fact that I don't look like their sister you know that I don't look like someone they grew up with or someone they know it will play a part if it's between me and say a fellow white female photographer they may well feel more comfortable with with her um question question for on. you both sorry so a lot of we live in a busy crowded world it's often difficult to remember people their names i think we're all in the habit of nicknaming people so for example in the gym you don't even know someone's name but they're known as red t-shirt guy or you know this person or that guy hypothetically let's imagine there's an advertising agency somewhere and they're around a table and they're talking about a job would it bother you if they said those two asian guys they could be great for this would that bother you it would it, it would probably bother it would bother me because or if they said that that but, korean but, but, photographer she could be great for this but, but they couldn't remember your name but they remembered your look your work would that is that a negative or is that a positive how do you guys feel about that in an ideal world they'd remember your website your domain but one could argue it's a benefit that you stood out mm. the, and you've won this job the other could argue that I just want to be known as Amit and Rook or, or, or Emily full stop I shouldn't be known as Emily the Korean yeah, what do you yeah. Think? I think for me it would uh, it would actually depend on what job they were talking about so it was if I was Japanese noodles then yeah, I would probably slightly question, you know, what what made them think of me, uh, you know, yeah. in that sense. But if it if it was purely a descriptor, yeah, um, you know, the you know equal to person in the red t shirt or yeah, yeah. With spiky hair or whatever else. Not necessarily. I think the only problem would possibly be again if they just said Asian, um, if they said Korean. It'd be different at least it means they had some sort of understanding and you know actually for me it would have to be sort of korean danish for it to even reflect who i am but you know same as you wouldn't describe what well, they wouldn't describe um an english photographer as a european photographer you know that would not be a descriptor but i think acknowledging that we are part of a minority where our you know our ethnicity does stand out in, in, you know, in this industry. I think it can be, that can be fairly neutral. You know, it could be talking about the tall person, the short person or, or whatever else, but of course there's, there are connotations uh, related to it. So I think it really depends on the context. Yeah, because you, you used to say that you love that feeling of going into an ad agency and being 
extra remembered, not just I, because I, I, of our no, work, I, but because we're rarity. I do, I do like, I do like being, um, I do like the fact of going to an environment where I know we're the only people of colour, because I'm, I, I feel okay now. I'm gonna, sh I am not gonna wimp away and hide away. I want people to remember us and know who we are, and and it's it's almost more for me to say, look. I'm in an environment which other people could seem as being a difficult or even a threatening environment. But guess what? I'm going to prosper in this environment. So it's not like, it's not I'm doing it for everyone else. I'm doing it for myself. So I walk out of there and feel like, you know, I, you are confident. It's confidence. You know, yeah, no, you're confident, dude. You should be proud of who you are. You never, you didn't look kind of hide in the corner or feel like, you know, people shouldn't talk to you. You, you don't have the right to talk to that person. So that's more of a, a personal exercise because it does take a certain amount of confidence if you're only one of a certain, you know, uh, colour. Or even like, you know, when we were shooting our seat project, that some of the guys would say, you know, no matter what, what the world is like now, they'll always feel like they have a turban on their head. They'll walk in and they know everyone's going to look at their turban, right? So yeah. it's, but then they still do what they need to do. They don't let it hold them back. It's the same thing with with colors we can never hold us back and yeah. if anything you know and some people might disagree but i think we should be super confident you know and 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 go in there and feel like you know we we are all human you know we want to be respected for our background but yet you know we we all are the same on the inside so you know it's it's that kind of hard balance you want to respect people but you don't want to you also don't want to disrespect people or them to disrespect you so I think that's the I think that's the the interesting balance. Um, so, how would you say that your um, your kind of Danish background? How did that influence? Do you think that's influenced your um, your thought process, your mentality? You know, um, in getting into the creative industry, um, and 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 why do you think there are so few uh, Asian photographers in the industry? Is it is it a similar um, kind of social family kind of issues that we feel it is with with uh, with Indian um you know uh photographers or brown photographers do you feel it's the same kind of uh relationship there so for me I can't I can't speak to traditional Korean uh families or culture uh because I was adopted so I was adopted when I was three months old from Korea to Denmark so in in most respects, or pretty much all respects, I was raised as a as a Danish white person with a with a pretty white outlook. Um, I grew up in a you know a small town. There were miraculously two other Korean adoptees. Um, I was often mistaken for one of the others, um, uh, but I mean we're, we're talking not even a village. You know there were about a hundred people in this in this place. Um, so statistically, I think we were, we were we were quite unusual, quite multicultural. Um, so I couldn't say I couldn't sort of speak to to the Korean experience in that sense, um, which I think going back to your previous point is is something for me. So when you when you talk about your heritage, mm -hmm. for me, my heritage is 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 quite checkered. Mm -hmm. So it's not one hundred percent Danish. It's not one hundred percent Korean. Um, it's it's not just about ethnicity. Of course, there's gender on top. There's you know sexuality. There's there's so many things. You know, there's motherhood. You know, there's, there's you guys will know as well. You know, and um, and I wouldn't necessarily put my ethnicity as the top of at the top of what I feel. Well, A defines me, and B what I'm being uh, identified by. I might be wrong about that, but but that's my sort of. That's my feeling. I'd say my my gender, for instance, probably comes before that when it comes to what what other people see. Mm. Um, but well, yeah. So so that means that my my in terms of representing who I am, it's it. I, I'm I'm part of a very very small group. If you narrow down, you know, if you take into consideration all the sort of intersections that that my identity sort of covers. Mm. Um, and I think in a way that goes back to being an adoptee, because when you're adopted, you start, you're sort of cut off at the root, you know, right at the beginning, you know, so like at three months old, I arrived in a, 
in another country, of course, I have no recollection of that, but it means more or less literally reinventing yourself right from the beginning. Um, and I think just from, from sort of my, my personal life, I've had that experience repeatedly through, you know, change. I had quite a tumultuous sort of family upbringing anyway. It was quite changeable. So it meant a lot of new changes, a lot of new schools, a lot of, you know, sort of new family members, all these things. So, um, so if anything, well, but, well, possibly that feeds into the fact that I do end up being more the person in the corner who has to chat. Not in a, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't say I'm sort of uh, shrinking violet or particularly shy, but I just, I just don't necessarily have the, this, this, the sense of, as the sense of, uh, of identity to sort of stand up and go, well, this is 100% who I am because I feel there's so many aspects. Yeah. And so purely walking into a space going, here I am representing Korean, Danish, adoptees, you know, is, 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 um, I totally it's, get quite, you. it's quite a small camp. <laughs> Can I ask you a question, Emily? If you were exactly the same person, um, but you're white Danish, not Korean Danish, mm -hmm. in your opinion, do you think your career would have progressed faster and to a higher level by now or not? That's a really good question. Uh, I think without a doubt, actually, my gut feeling is yes. Interesting. Yeah. Can I ask I think you the same question? If you were non-Indian, if you were white male, Andrew uh, and Nigel sitting here, you, would it be any different? I don't know. I really don't know. So we've got yes on this side. We've got... I'm, I'm not too sure. Um, you know, like you, I don't... We haven't personally faced any discrimination where someone hasn't... Actually, we faced a little bit of discrimination last week when we were in the Cotswolds. It wasn't really discrimination. Is when someone thought we were the... Oh, they thought we were the best. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. We, we were... So we were in... I, was, I digress, but I'll come back to your question. We were in this pub. Uh-huh. Oh, right. right? Very posh. Yeah. And yeah. these two ladies come and sit next to us. Both were white. And yeah. they said hello to us. And, and we, we started talking. And, and then they said, oh, where are you from? And we said, oh, well, Connie Tell, we're not from around here. We're from London. And they said, oh, why, sh why should we not know the thing you from around here? Oh, and, then, and, then, <laughs> and then one of the women said, oh, actually, yeah, I thought you were the nephews of the corner shop owner over there. Right? And <laughs> we could have easily kicked off and said, yeah. that's so racist. <laughs> you know we said, oh, no, you're so funny. Because, you know what, what's the point? What, is, like, what am I going to achieve? Are we just starting our dinner. They're starting theirs. It's going to cause a problem. And I, I think was, they meant it in a playful way. They did, they way, did, they, they did. But still, the, still yeah, even, the playful world, them, yeah. even the playful world, I had it. Uh, yeah. I would never say it to somebody and else. And they did, and we go to the corner shop after yeah, we went to the corner and shop. there was no Indian. Yeah, we, we went to the corner shop and it was a white person who owned it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But, um, but, yeah, we haven't faced any, any prejudice. So I don't really know. I I just think that we we when we started, we were so passionate about our brand being Amit and Narup and we've got to stick by our names. You know, yeah. these are our names, we're Indian names, and we're proud yeah. of these names that we pushed and pushed that, that yeah. brand of these two brown boys who work together. Yeah. You know? And I think yeah. in some ways people just work, they didn't have a choice, they just had to accept it. Well, okay, you're two brown boys that work together. You know, amazing. And I think that that kind of helped us at that early stage, just kind of to find for people to find us amongst everybody else. You know, you're talking about being memorable, yeah. being memorable. Um, but yeah, I think we probably could have. What happened very early in our career, we were labeled as being urban photographers for so long. Yeah. You, were urban, you do urban music. So all we were shooting was black music artists for record yeah. labels. Yeah. And it used to get frustrating because we could shoot other stuff, but we yeah. could never get commission. It's okay. Yeah. I mean, Rube, they do the cool urban stuff, get them on there, get, shoot, that, shoot that person. And then we're like, why are we only shooting like men, colored men? Why? That's all we're, yeah. that's all we're shooting. You know? And, and why, why do you think that? I mean, yeah, exactly. Well, that's the reason. So I guess that way it did stop us. But we literally, yeah. we didn't even get a break from the industry. We had to get, it was when a, a makeup artist of ours, a friend recommended us to an art director who's her friend in an ad agency, recommended yeah. us to do a job and we did it. And then that was our first, well, we got white people on the site. Like, you know, <laughs> it literally, you yeah. know, yeah. and it started to pick up from there. So, you know, maybe it did hold us back. You know, it probably yeah. did, you know, but, I, I like to believe times have changed now, but 
the funny thing is now that the work that we did then would be seen as being so current and so cool. Exactly. Like within, street, within street youth, this is where Adidas and Nike and all these people want to target. It would yeah. have been an amazing book, but then it was purely music, urban, street, raw, gritty, you know, and, you know, we needed the money. So we were nowhere going to kick up a fuss. So we're like, yeah, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. But that is interesting that, Emily, you think your career may well have progressed further then if you were, if you were non-Korean. Who, who knows? You know, it's it's so hard to it's so hard to say. But if I if I picture, uh, um, yeah, if I if I said if it was just my God instinct when you asked that question, I thought yes, I, th I think so. Um, so honestly, so, so do, do you get a lot of um, Korean Asian photographers emailing you, messaging you, asking for advice? Because we we've noticed recently since we've become more vocal. Mm -hmm. And speaking about, about it, a lot of photographers have started to message us. We're mentoring yeah. a, a few now, um, mm -hmm. but we're helping others on the side. And yeah. and we, we feel we it's our duty to do that, just mm -hmm. to pass on, okay. pass on, you know, our experiences. So it would be great to, to hear if, if, if you, you know, people have been approaching you and, and also what advice you would offer any photographers of colour you know, yeah. based upon your experience of how you were able to, you know, you, you're represented, but you've got an agent. That's a very hard thing to, to, to get. What mm -hmm. advice would you give and, you know, do people approach you? So the advice I'd give would be to really um, basically benefit from the fact that the creative world has been democratized a lot through the internet. Mm. Just came out sort of starting at university level, but me say, well, you know, we it's it's even before then. It's just knowing that photography is a job that you know the creative industries is is somewhere you can work and make a make a proper living um, and be professional, not just sort of waking up at ten o'clock and lounging about and all the rest. You know, it's kind of it's a real job, um, and I think that that can start. You know, at the same time when you're aware of all the other jobs in the world, you know, like police officers, school teachers, whatever you talk to kids about early on, you know, that that photography and, and the rest is, is also a career and a viable one. Um, the, the one thing I've noticed with uh, the sort of the young and upcoming photographers that I meet now that sort of approach me is that their sense of uh, creative self, I think is a lot more refined than mine was at, at their stage, at their level. Um, because my references were were just way more limited. You know, it was it was print magazines. It was whatever the people I was assisting were doing, and then a couple of you know the big names who were by and large again going by sort of white middle aged, probably middle class men. Um, whereas now, you know, you, you you go on Instagram and and it's just it's just filled. I mean, if anything, it's you know you're completely oversaturated with with input and, and impressions and it's overwhelming at times, but it's also fantastic and it's so rich. You know, there's such a tapestry where you can go, okay, I like this, I see myself in this, I absolutely do not see myself in this, etc. cetera. But Whereas how, for me, how, sorry, go how do you think though that these people are gonna get found? Because the, I think the problem is, is that, you know, fair enough, people say social media, mm. but it's just, there's just so much stuff. And I've, I've actually, um, stepped away from social media just because I can't look at the screen that much. It's it's too much information going into my head. I'm, and you know we're working and we're editing and I'm looking at a screen and thinking of ideas. And the more stuff I see, I just feel like my brain fills up with stuff, and then I feel congested in my mind. Yeah. And since I've taken yeah. a step back, I honestly and I'm, it's just not not something I'm just saying, but. I feel so much freer. I'm going to take you to Pilates yeah. with me as well. I, 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 I feel You're a new so man. <laughs> I, I, I feel so much freer because, you know, ultimately as, as creators, we have to think that for me, especially the space around me does determine how I feel and the ideas that I come up with, right? And if I feel like I'm looking at too much stuff, I get overloaded. So, you know, people say, you know, have an Instagram account, but then how are you going to get, noticed on that Instagram, how are you going to get noticed amongst all these people, you know? And I think we were at a fortunate stage and we were getting into the industry. We, we didn't have that. And I'm kind of glad. I'm really yeah. glad because we had, we had MySpace, 
right? And we started on MySpace and we got found by a MySpace. But no way, that's amazing. Instagram now, you know, how would we get from, I don't, I don't know if we would because the, the people who are getting, who are big accounts, they do post a lot and they do do a lot. The, the, the input in it is a lot. And I personally, as a father, you know, I wouldn't have the time to do that. I don't have the time. And you know, we could easily have a YouTube channel and do all these things, but I value my time away from work a lot as well. Yeah. I need yeah. that balance. So, you know, yes. people ask me, how should, how should we market ourselves? And I, I kind of say, well, you know, you, you can have, have an Instagram account, but then I feel like I'm cheating them a little bit because they're going to do it and they're not going to necessarily get the results that they want. And it's not an easy question to answer. Um, but I've been saying to people, especially, I, I've been saying, yes, you need to have that social aspect, but you also need to have the people network. Yeah, a lot of people are lack it are not putting time into the people they're meeting. So I say, look, you know, put some time into that, but also meet some good people, meet people as much as you can, and build go through their network because word of mouth is still a powerful thing. And you meet the right person, and you know it. I'm sure it's happened to you. You said it yourself. You met some some people, and it helped you progress in your career. And Absolutely. and are, are people totally moving away from that? And I think especially for us being people of color, meeting the right people can definitely you know give 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 you that kind of uh, that hand up that you need and that you know that leg up so you know that's what i that's what i kind of said what do you yeah. what do you think yeah i think i think it's important to just give people faith watching this like you said this is a viable career if you get it right um i'd question question for you turning points in your career when you got an agent um how did that happen and how did that make you feel and did that kind of change your 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 work if if you like so i think so many up and coming photographers dream of finding an agent who will just handle the business the marketing them they can focus on the creative but we all know that the reality and the challenges that come with that maybe you could talk us through your your journey of of your you uh, getting with your agent if you could um yeah so i mean well same as, as you described before i i signed with jermaine walker i I definitely had this idea as well that, you know, getting an agent would just be, you know, a uh, one-stop fix it all. And, uh, you know, I'd be, I'd never have to promote myself again and work would just come rolling in. And of course, uh, I've, I've met with a, a few agents, you know, in different capacities often. It was just sort of when I was starting out, you know, just getting advice. And, and a lot of the, uh, the London agents are, I mean, really, they're so helpful and supportive and, you know, are there if, if they have the time and the capacity they'll offer you feedback even if you know ultimately they're not looking to sign you but but they're happy to guide you and help you in the industry and I, I still find that now um and I think across the board you know the, the message was do not think that you sign with an agent and that means that you can stop you can stop mark you know marketing yourself and all the rest um so for me um the reason why how you got the agent? I, sorry. The reason how, how you got the agent? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I basically I spoke to um, a couple of people, and in the end, there were sort of there were two agents that I were having conversations with, and one was um, one I would say aesthetically was uh, was a roster I felt I would sit really really nicely in. Um, and possibly we were we were quite similar people in a way whereas with uh, Jermaine what I found was that she was um, much much tougher than I am um, and her her drive was was supposed to be more commercial um, and so it's sort of it, it, I was basically weighing up those two things um, and I think well, I hope, no, I'm sure, in fact, that, you know, I, I, well, I made a decision and I feel like it was the right decision because what Jermaine and, uh, and, and Morgan um, sort of do, do for me is the bits that I don't like, you know, so they do all the, you know, the, the production talk, the, the bits, you know, where, you know, what it's like on a shoot and the client says, can we just have an additional five assets, you know, at the end of the day? And I go, sure. And then they go, if, you know, and so, um, Basically, they, they, you know, they talk shop and it means that I, I don't have to deal with that as much. Um, you know, I think we forget how lucky we are sometimes having mm -hmm. 
agents. I think mm. we sometimes it's the normal now, we take it for granted. But we're lucky to have brilliant partners, you know, that support us, understand us, nurture us. And I think that for anyone starting out, it is scary on your own. Yeah. You're like, how on earth? When we started out, we'd, we'd email the world's biggest ad agencies when we were like 21 with our portfolio shot in my mum's living room. And I'm like, a bit of a sort they might like. Yeah. They might like uh, that. I, now yeah. I'm like, what are we on, man? I remember, I remember going to a meeting at another agency. I've forgotten who it was. And the woman came down to meet me and you couldn't make that one. Mm. And we didn't, you know, even then we didn't even have you know the landscapes book we had a small portrait style book she came down she met me and she was looking through the work and she was looking at me <laughs> i think now in hindsight she's looking at me thinking what are you smoking because the work <laughs> was just not right and How i'm just sitting there smiling yeah. like yeah well this one we did this and we used backlighting here just <laughs> just probably thinking dude are you still at a, a college or something? You're, you're thinking of thinking this one job you're proud of your student yeah. loan in one go. <laughs> yeah, t- totally, t- totally disillusioned. But, you know, that na- naivety and this optimism, I think, is what helped us to keep pushing. So we're like, well, there's nothing wrong with the work. Maybe, you know, they just haven't got the right job for us. But, yeah. and then yeah. hindsight, no, totally weren't ready. Um, well, I think these are important stories to tell people that we've yeah. all come, we've all been where everyone is starting out. Like, look, we we tried everything under the sun to try to make money. We had this um, a crazy idea to make these art pieces of moving traffic. So we we used to go into London at freezing cold um, and just shoot cars move going past Big Ben, the good thing, Bankman. And then we'd stylize them and put effects on them in Photoshop and we print them and and we got like a, a art distributor to we paid the money to for them to try. Did it, to, didn't you walk yeah. down the King's Road? Uh, yeah, we Chelsea, walk, walk, walk down trying to sell them to the galleries. Shops, yeah, in Kings Road in Chelsea to try to sell them. We, we, went to, we went to the art fair in London and saw that no one else had this artwork. So we thought, wow, ours is gonna be amazing. And it just When you're approaching galleries itself, yeah. this was hundreds hundreds of thousands. And it's just it's obviously it was it was rubbish. I, mean, I, love I look at them, but do you know what? I, I would not. The kids I, I, don't regret, I don't regret it. I do not regret yeah. it because I remember what it feels like to be freezing cold and taking those pictures. I yeah. remember it and I cherish that moment because, you know, it's, it's the journey. And, and speaking of wrong assumptions, what happened with the police one evening? So we were outside Big Ben and, uh-huh. and we're taking photos and the police stop us. They come up to us and they said something to us. And we thought they said, are you terrorists? And, they, and we said, what do you mean we're terrorists? They said, no, no, are you tourists? And we said, oh, no, no, we're not, we're not tourists. But, you know, being proud. And we're taking photos of Big Ben. Like, with our backpacks on. With our backpacks on. And it was just, it was an amazing, amazing journey. But we were two crazy kids who had this dream. But this kind of leads back to, like, the next question. Our family would still supported us through all of that, you know. Yeah. We would do some, come home late, and mum would go, Nuru, where have you gone? And I said, oh, me and Amit were shooting some art pieces. Don't worry, we've a value. We've put a value on them. We've shot 25 pieces, and we thought, you know, we're going to have two hundred editions. Each edition will sell for 2000 so we're going to make, you know, X amount of money. And I remember we were lying we on valued a, at six we, million. We were lying we? on a sofa like, oh, that's going to be a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> 10%, I'm happy with yeah. 600K a year. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but but well, this, this leads on to the question that our, our family supported us, right? But a lot yeah. of people we talk to, you know, the number one thing they say is, how do I tell my parents that? My parents just keep saying to me, what are you doing? And when they get told day in, day out, what the hell are you doing? This photography stuff, yeah. you know what it's like. And I do tell, I am honest with people. I say, look, if you want to really be a master, right, and make good money for 10 years, you have got to be willing to live off nothing or you know, a very small wage, Right. And I don't, I don't think that's, a, you know, I think that's an accurate amount of time, 10 years to really build up a body of work, to understand who you are, develop your style, build the contacts, have a good enough book, maybe get an agent if you can by then. And I, I was chatting to one guy, I said, dude, have you got the heart to do it for 10 years and then make money? Right. Yeah. Answer that, I'll answer that question. Yeah. And it's tough. You know, that's why I always say you have to try to start when you're young. But if someone says to you, you know, Emily, my, um, you know, my parents just, there's at my, at my my at me every day telling me you know you know I've, I've, you've been for uni you've done this that and the other now you're just doing photography what would you say you know what would be your advice to that person well I think I'd say like go down to Big Ben yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, 
<laughs> it's a winning formula. No, I think it's a really good question. I mean, the, the, the thing that came into my mind when you were talking about your, your sort of, your process, if you like, you know, or your journey. And for me as well, it's a process. <laughs> it's a process. <laughs> I think technically it's a process. <laughs> may not be the most traditional process. Um, no, I think, the, I think the key word is, is tenacity. You know, and, and, and I sort of say that rather than drive or ambition or whatever else, because it is literally just this sort of, I had a lot of uh, people saying, you know, what are you doing wandering into this industry that's already then, you know, is over, overbooked, oversaturated, underpaid, you know, because already my sort of my taste of it was people saying, can you do this job? We have 50 pounds, including travel or whatever else, you know, and I would do it. Um and it wouldn't, they wouldn't be creatively fulfilling jobs and they certainly wouldn't be financially viable jobs either. But like you, I just had to scramble. I had to do whatever I, I could, you know. So I would work nine to five jobs doing whatever, you know, whether it's cafes or offices or whatever else, temp jobs, and then try to take pictures in the evening. Um, and I remember I assisted um, Harry Borden, who, who would have said, well, you know, try to look at your work as either, or your, your jobs as either portfolio or money jobs. Which, which I think is really good sort of baseline advice, but I think it only applies after 10 years, after the 10 years you're referring to. So now I'm in a position where I'm fortunate enough to, to be able to do that and say, okay, you know, this, this will neither help me pay the bills or, you know, look particularly great in my book afterwards. So maybe it's not right for me. Um, and, and likewise doing jobs that aren't very well paid, but that I'm really, you know, that I believe in. So, so going back to your original question, I mean, if people are telling you to get a real job and, you know, to not play the long game, I mean, it, it's, it's so individual. So for me, I, you know, I, I had to basically do both. I had to do the, the office work to make the, you know, the bare amount of money. And then, you know, I didn't, I didn't own, um, a camera for for a long time you know I would go to Jacobs Digital and Tottenham Court Road and and rent it there and I sort of uh, got friend, friendly with a couple of the staff there so they would sort of help me out a bit you know and, and explain kit to me and and all the rest and then assisting was was the other you know route that I would say is more viable now mm. um, because assistants can make really good money um, yeah. so if you Actually, you know what? Yeah, I think that that's probably, it's a good in-between, but you really get a taste for the industry, good and bad, and you can go home and tell your parents you're making money, you know, like a, like a, like a traditional sort of... The only downside to assistants is sometimes they can get so comfortable being the assistant and they almost know it's solid, regular money that they sometimes say, I don't want to be the main photographer. I, some, some people, some people don't. There's yeah, nothing, wrong, nothing with wrong with that. But I'm saying it depends on yeah. where they like, <laughs> again. Because you almost get yeah. spoiled. You're like, I'm getting my regular job. I'm, you know, got these four or five photographers. Um, but if I step out and I go solo, yeah. you know, it's difficult, right? But um, no, I agree. I think it's a, I think it's great. We've never assisted anyone in our life. Mm -hmm. So whenever okay. we have an assistant, we actually yeah. ask them, "What's it like?" What's it like working with Emily? Like, how does she do this? What's the protocol? What's that? Because we're, yeah. you know, we've we've invented yeah. our own formula. Yeah, which is which is kind of mad in yeah. some ways. Brilliant. One, one thing I was saying to this guy the other day on the phone, um, who's having uh, issues with his family, I said, you know, if your family give you are giving you uh, trouble, you have to show them that you're giving a hundred percent, right? Because sometimes yeah. parents might say something to you if they think you're wasting time. Like if you're just partying, going to, you know, getting up late, doing it. But if you're up at six or seven and you're working and you're hustling and you're shooting, they can see that you are grinding. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be very few parents who are going to say, what are you doing? Because they can see you're putting your blood, sweat and tears into this. It's, yeah. if you're not. If you're watching Netflix and like, yeah, I'm trying to be a photographer, then they're going to, and I would say the same thing to my daughter. Like, what are you doing? Like, you know, um, yeah. So yeah. I can show them. And, and yeah. also, you know, I think accountability is an amazing thing. You have to be accountable. You know, it is a job. And, you know, another thing we all tell people is put stuff in the diary. If, you, if it's a test shoot, put it in your diary. And you know what? That can't be moved for, you know, a night out with the friends or a day in Hyde Park because you put yeah. it in there. Otherwise, everything yeah. 
pushed back. Your career gets pushed back. Your goals get pushed back. You get frustrated. You don't achieve what you want to achieve. So I think having yeah. something to be accountable to and saying to your parents, look, give me four years or two years or three years. If I'm not earning, you know, a couple of grand a month, then you can say something to me, you know. But yeah. the beautiful thing is that couple of grand can quickly tally up to you earning good money if you get into into commercial, you know, photography like, like we know. So that's that's something that we say. I'm, I, I'm just trying to think of the things that I know have had a positive impact on people. And I think this is regardless of colour anyway. It's just generally it's hard. No matter what you look like now, it's, it's difficult to try to get in there. But, um, it's, it's a hard industry for sure. And it's not like once you've once you're in once you have an agent that doesn't mean you're sorted or, or that you know you know I, I still have the sort of will I ever work again you know sort of 3 a.m 3 a.m moments for sure and I'm sure that that won't ever stop and that's probably not a bad thing you know but I, th I think that's kind of beyond photography that's the nature of being freelance you know and I think again that's an important lesson to I think to pass on is that the work doesn't stop um and whether it's so at the moment, you know, I, I don't with two young kids, et cetera, et cetera. I don't at the moment have time to do test shoots, but I try to at least take, you know, I aim for one one picture a day, which inevitably becomes sort of one picture every two or three days or, or whatever. But even if it's with your phone or, you know, it's kind of it's just paying attention to like you say, kind of stepping away from from your from your screen and just looking at at the world around you and practicing even if it's just going I would take that picture if I did have my phone I mean because our, our work is different, I suppose our approach would be different like that so mine is often looking at the incident so, so different different things would apply to different types of working um, but but I think I mean you know I think you saying hustle is is, is, a, is a great word that covers it you know what I mean it is just whatever you need to do you know so uh, you know I was a secretary for the NHS and you know sort of just you know and it was I love that I, I, I love that I love it when people tell me stories like that that I did this and I just I, I had to do it. I love that because that shows so much about the character and then I also you know I want them to win because they've, they've done so much you know what yeah. we've got a, yeah. a few minutes left I had a, I know you probably got a question I've got a couple of questions for you uh, mm -hmm. I know you're very passionate about you know, trying to make change for, for people of colour in the industry. And you said that you're working on some projects. It'd be interesting to know what you're doing on your own side to kind of promote change. Obviously, you know, we're collabing on this. Um, you know, we're, we're both part of the AOP group trying to promote change. But is there anything you're doing yourself that you'd want people to know about? Um, in a word, at the moment, no. I had a, um, my, my plan was pre-COVID to, uh, to go back to South Korea this year um, and start a project that has been underway pretty much my whole life. <laughs> you know, um, I haven't been back to South Korea um, and I am pretty terrified by the idea because my gut feeling is that uh, the person I am now wouldn't, wouldn't fit very well with South Korean culture. So it's, it's quite a, it's, a, it's an interesting, it'll be an interesting project once it happens and it will be a very personal one. And, I'm, you know, again, I've spoken to lots of people over the years about it. And I think my main, my main feeling is, you know, take my camera along, document whatever's there, but try not to have a, an end goal in mind. Um, but it's a very specific project that would possibly mostly resonate with people who you know, have been one way or the other sort of uh, removed from their original heritage or who are trying to connect with a heritage that they don't fully understand. And in fact, you know, when I was younger, I used to more or less reject that that part of me. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's taken years and I still, I'm still working out who I am in, in, in a sort of, in that, in that sense, you know, skin colour and ethnicity is one thing, but in, in terms of actual identity, it's a you know it's a it's an ongoing journey um but that's kind of it for creative projects um aside from that I mean I, I I sort of I speak to quite a wide variety of photographers both you know uh, white and people of color um just about constantly just holding each other and ourselves to to account you know making sure that 
you know, this didn't just happen, you know, back in, what was it, April, May, or, you know, when, when everyone was, you know, sort of had, you know, three weeks of posting black squares and, and retweeting lots of pretty boxes, you know, it has to go beyond that. So I try to to keep that going behind the scenes. And, and that means talking to my agent as well about what, you know, what we can do. And they're very, um, very open and, and, and try to also be active in, in moving things along. Um, they, you know, it's a it's a, an all female uh, agency or a female run agency. Um, so again, they are they're familiar with being othered at least. Um, but that you know, they're also conscious that they're an all white agency, and you know, it's it, you know, there's not a a, a black or a brown uh, artist on on their roster currently. You know, there are two Southeast Asian photographers, me and um, Tony, but. Um, you know, it's it's very obvious if you look at, at you know, going back to talking about agents, if you look at rosters across the, the sort of commercial agents, I mean, there aren't many people yeah, of colour, let alone. And I think I think that's an important point as well, you know, which is, uh, you know, I guess colorism because, we, yes, we're people of colour, but I think it's important to also note that our experiences of, well, certainly mine is, is vastly different from that of, say, a young black man growing up in in London you know it's like it's you can't really compare the two you know I'm sure there are some crossovers but no more no less than I would have with I don't know some you know some other random person um so I I think that's another thing that that I personally sort of try to remind myself of as well that you know come up with challenges because of me as, as many others um so I think it's just, you know, it's, it's giving opportunities and, and that's kind of, for me, you know, in, in small but practical terms, it's, it's, you know, bringing along assistance, making sure I pay them um, and, you know, like try not to sort of get people along to intern if, you know, if, if at all possible. Um, and, and yeah, just, you know, encouraging them to, to work their way up and, and, and trying to give them that network that you're talking about, because I think they can get their inspiration from, you know, whether it's from from studying or from from the internet, from social media, etc. And then in terms of actual real life people and names and you know the right email addresses and just those little introductions, you know, whenever I can, I I, I put those in, because it's it's such a small thing for me to do, but it could literally, you know, it could help someone's career so immensely. Yeah, I think I think you've kind of hit hit it nail on the head there. I think by having conversations like this, by um, photographers of color who are established, helping um, those who are coming up through mentorship, through discussions, through any other content we can put up, I think slowly the ripples will, will kind of spread, and people will see that you know sometimes all people need is a bit of encouragement. That, you know, it doesn't matter, I can get through this. You know, Emily went through it, Amit and Ruth went through it. You know, that person went through it, I can do it too. And slowly you start to see a shift. So I think what you're doing, even though you're saying, you know, you're not working on any projects, you are doing something uh, fantastic just by giving a time like this and talking to people. You know, just changing one people, person's life can, can have a, a big impact on a lot of other people as well. So, you know, um, I think what you're doing is fantastic. And you know, we want to continue to do this more and more, and uh, and just to share people's stories. So it's been it's been, it's been so great having you uh, today on this. Uh, you know, to, to talk with us. Um, Amit, have you got any yeah, questions you'd like to? A couple, couple of things come to mind. Eminem comes to mind. Mm. White rapper, highly successful. Do you think when Eminem made it mainstream, it gave other white rappers hope? Probably that they could do well in a predominantly black industry. Probably, yeah. Yeah, are we Eminem equivalents ish? Us three. <laughs> no one has ever asked me that before. <laughs> um, I like to think we call them Eminem, but maybe not. Um, they, no, it's a good question. You I see the has, comparison. There is there. a comparison there. You've got a, you've because got it'd a, been intimidating for a white kid to go to a group of black rappers. They're like, "You're a white kid. You can't rap." This is what the yeah. stereotypes are, maybe. But then someone like Eminem, you see that and. Surely he gave other people. But then the, the flip side is, is this. My brother's actually a very famous singer. So he's had a number one hit in America. He's an R&B artist signed to, you know, all the has been signed to major, major labels across, you know, the UK and, and America. But no one's followed him. There's never been another Indian R&B 
Popeyes. And okay. that's that's interesting. And I put it down to who he is as a man. Mm. He's so likable, a very a humble guy. Everybody kind of gets on with him. It, girls fancy him. Guys think he's cool. You know, yeah. so it's, he, he had you know, the winning formula. Yeah. And sometimes having just one of those things, oh, I'm brown, I, sh- I can sing, that's not enough. You yeah. know, and that's why we also say to people, yeah, do you know what? You know, you might be of colour and you might want to do it, but guess what? Your work might also just not be good enough, no matter, no matter what colour you are. Mm. So don't let the colour thing distract you and think, I'm good, but, you know, it's because it's cause I'm brown or because I'm black or whatever that I'm not making. No, your work quite, it's not be that good. You know, and yeah. it's, hard, it's, it's hard to say that to people, you know, the first, think, first and foremost, you have to be good at what you do. Absolutely. And I, I think that's a really valid point. But I think as a, as a sort of counter, well, a supporting argument, but also sort of the flip side of it is how many white photographers may have made it despite their work not being mm. on par with the black photographer who didn't make it. You know, and I think that's where that's where, you know, ethnicity and, and skin colour does come into play. You know, it's it's the bits that we don't see. You know, it's, it's, it's I've had a, a few conversations like that, you know, with people saying, well, we can't just employ people because they're brown. And, um, you know, and I'm like, that's not, that's not what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying, it, you know, give the person who's brown the same opportunity you would as the person who's white who also doesn't have any experience, you know. I th- you know, there's so many, there are so many factors and it's hard to account for all that. You know, I think it's, it's, uh, you might talk about being a nice person, but again, what does nice mean? It was, it's within a certain framework and it means, you know, possibly there's, there's a class thing involved in that, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things and, and that, th- that you might just not know. And it's really hard. To yeah. Luck plays a big, big part in Sorry. it. Sometimes just being lucky to get that job or just like, mm. you know, you're lucky that the art, art buyer opens your email that day and doesn't open someone else's and that leads to a job which can then you know spiral onto more things so you know you can't you can't downplay that that side of it too but i think we have to we have to wrap it up there guys and just closing comment i can see why you're so successful because it's not just your work you're you're brave you're kind you're talented and i think it's that combination of producing you are honestly i could talk to you for eight hours if we had the time and i think I think all of us photographers, filmmakers, creatives, all we need is that opportunity to get our personality across even more because we all live in this world where we just judge someone like this. We see all their work, you know, which is which is great. Let's be honest, loads of people can produce work of a high standard and calibre yeah. now. But I think the icing on the cake is is our personalities and, and getting across what people can expect from us spending a day with us. And I think you're brilliant. If I were a client or an ad agency, I'd, I'd happily trust you because you've... You're great with people, ultimately, and I think that's what that's what people want, you know. And your work is is outstanding. So I'm I'm optimistic. I'm excited. And my closing comments and advice to everyone in the industry is: your work is important, but your personality is key, and you need to do everything in your power to try and get that across. Because once you can do that, opportunities will start coming and, and flowing your way. But no, I've had a delightful afternoon with you both. Thank you very much. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. And, and- yeah, keep keep doing what you're doing because it's it's inspiring, and I'm sure it will make a big difference. I'm sure it already is. So thank you. Thanks, Thanks Emily. Thank you. Have a great afternoon. Take care. Take care.